Early in his first term, the president called a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and told them that every offensive weapon ever invented by man has resulted in the creation of a defense against it. He asked if it weren't possible in this age of technology that we could invent a defensive weapon that could intercept nuclear weapons and destroy them as they emerged from their silos. The Joint Chiefs looked at one another and asked to meet privately for a few minutes. Soon they responded. Yes, it's an idea worth exploring. The President's retort, let's do it. And so the SDI was born, and very shortly named by some in Congress and the press as Star Wars. We seek to render obsolete the balance of terror, or mutual assured destruction as it's called, and replace it with a system incapable of initiating armed conflict or causing mass destruction, yet effective in preventing war. Now this is not and should never be misconstrued as just another method of protecting missile silos. The Strategic Defense Initiative has been labeled Star Wars, but it isn't about war. It's about peace. It isn't about retaliation. It's about prevention. It isn't about fear. It's about hope. And in that struggle, if you'll pardon my stealing a film line, the force is with us. President Reagan concedes that some people may take a different view, but he feels that if he had to choose the single most important reason on the United States side for the historic breakthroughs that were to occur during the next five years in a quest for peace and a better relationship with the Soviet Union, he would say it was the Strategic Defense Initiative, along with the overall modernization of U.S. military forces. The President had always felt that if he could just get in a room alone with the top Soviet leader, the two of them might be able to reduce the risk of nuclear war. Not long after his hospital discharge following the assassination attempt in 1981, President Reagan sent a handwritten letter to Leonid Brezhnev, the top Soviet leader, declaring his interest in opening a dialogue that would lead to peace. Reagan termed it quiet diplomacy. Unfortunately, the president got nowhere with Brezhnev, who died a short time later. He wrote similar letters to the two men who followed Brezhnev in the Kremlin, Yuri Andropov and Konstantin Chernyenko. But before a relationship could be established, each of these men also died. In March 1985, Chernyenko was succeeded by a new man in the Kremlin, Mikhail Gorbachev. That fall in Geneva, after exchanging several letters with him, President Reagan got his opportunity to meet with the Soviet leader alone in a room. We both must have the same intention. Yes, sir. If he feels as strongly that way as I do, then uh, we'll end the arms. But he says he also wants to stop Star Wars. I just wanted to explain to him we'll find that that can help us in the office. The president wanted to convince Gorbachev that the U.S. wanted peace and the Soviets had nothing to fear from us. So he went to Geneva with a plan. The Russians were bringing their team of diplomats and arms control experts and the U.S. were bringing theirs. The president wanted a chance to see Gorbachev alone. That morning, as they shook hands and Reagan looked into Gorbachev's smile, the president sensed that surge of optimism that his plan might work. As they began their first meeting in the presence of their advisors, Gorbachev and the president sat opposite one another. Reagan had advised his team of his plan, and as the technical experts began speaking, Reagan invited Gorbachev to step outside for some fresh air while their advisors discussed the need for arms control. Well, the Soviet leader was out of his chair before Reagan could finish his sentence. The two walked together about a hundred yards down a hill to a boathouse along a lakeshore arranged by President Reagan in advance. The two talked beside the fire, and the President felt Gorbachev had to know that the quality of American military technology since 1981 was now overwhelmingly superior to his own. President Reagan sensed the Soviet leader was well aware that the U.S. could outspend the Soviets on weapons for as long as we wanted to. He told Gorbachev, we have a choice. We can agree to reduce arms, or we can continue the arms race, which I think you know you can't win. We won't stand by and let you maintain weapon superiority over us, but together we can try to do something about ending the arms race. The meeting lasted an hour and a half, and when it was over, the president felt that something fundamental had changed in the relationship of their two countries. But he couldn't help thinking of Robert Frost's quote, there would be many miles to go before we sleep.
Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to welcoming, welcoming Mr. Gorbachev to the United States next year. And... Uh, And I have accepted his invitation to go to Moscow the following year. The world was on the threshold of a new day. Reagan and Gorbachev had the opportunity to make a safer, better place for now and the 21st century. But there was much more to be done. The foundation had been laid in Geneva.